And welcome back to the Always Be Building show, sponsored by Dynasty Football Factory Network. I am Stephen Chalmers. Joined as always, man on the right side of the screen, my buddy, partner in crime, Ryan O'Dell, aka Delhi. Say what's up to the people. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. We uh, said something in our last show that kind of connected with us both and got us got our minds flowing. A lot of times, especially in Dynasty community, we discount veterans way too much right like yeah sure it's nice to have young players on your team that you can have for multiple years that you can rely on right that's great but that being said it does take some vets to win a championship today we're going to take a look at some of these veterans you can look to add at a good value <laughs> to your team that can help you push for the championship and get that trophy in your lead baby steven veterans <clears throat> are so mismanaged in dynasty football that it's not funny. Yeah. When I think of a veteran and when I look at their value and I see that they're traded for pennies, maybe nickels and dimes on the quarter or on the dollar. It's never, it's never quarters. It's never 50 cents. It's never 75. It's never a dollar true value. These guys are league winner players. Right. And they're so mismanaged that it, drives me crazy i think to have a successful dynasty roster i think you have to have a a solid mix of young guys with veteran talent i think veterans for the veterans for the championship rosters are a key piece to success look at christian mccaffrey last year running back one number two overall fantasy player last year over 22 fantasy points per game look at Keenan Allen last year, who you can get in the 12th round of dynasty startups, a wide receiver five. Look yeah. at Mike Evans over a decade of time. You know what I mean? These are guys that we're probably going to cover through most of our podcasts. Tonight we're going to talk about the quarterback position and the running backs. <clears throat> Before I get there, always a DFF. I just want to – we want to talk about the fact that who covers dynasty? Debbie. Redraft. Best ball. Yeah. And DFS. If you guys aren't a part of the Dynasty Football Factory community, please look into changing that <clears throat> annually. Dollar forty nine, dollar ninety nine. Excuse me, dollar ninety nine annually comes out to it. Four ninety nine a month. It's a great, great, great community to be a part of, and you get access to our Discord. You get to come in and talk with us. A lot of great content creators over there at the DFF. <clears throat> so please take a look at it. Also. If you like what you hear tonight, we got a YouTube channel. Like, comment, subscribe, baby. Ryan, we're going to start off with the quarterbacks. Oh, all right. Works for me. You want to kick things off? You want me to get my first one out of the way? Uh, I like my quarterback. I think he's a great buy. Go ahead. I'm going to start. I'm going to talk about Mr. Jared Goff. So, great start. Comes in, comes in consensus QB 18. I think – I think the value changed once he signed his contract. So understand that, that as we talk about Jared Goff, things have changed a little bit in the last two weeks. He was more of a buy before the contract signing. Coming in at QB18, still a great buy. QB18 puts you mid-QB2. Let's just say you're playing a standard 12-team super flex. You're you're looking at a mid-QB2. So with Jared Goff, after the 2018 season, which is still the best season in the NFL for him, it was a lack of consistency. I do believe that when the Matt Stafford trade happened, he was a bridge gap guy. The Lions were looking for another answer. And, quote, unquote, they found their answer. They definitely did. Yes. Not, quote, unquote. They found their franchise. They found their guy. <laughs> uh, Jared Goff, 17.7 fantasy points per game. I don't have to talk about the numbers. QB 10. Finished in 2022, followed up with a QB7 finish in 2023. But then you're going to question me. What about his home road splits? What about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Don't care. Ben Johnson's in Ben Johnson's in Detroit. Mixed in with a top three offensive line. Mixed in with a top three skill position. Plethora of options here. Jared Goff, the easiest buy right now. QB18, I'm willing to push him up to QB16. They have Tua and Drake May over him. <clears throat> Not taking Drake May 
over Jared Goff by any means. I do believe that when Tua signs his contract, things can get dicey when it comes to that value as well. Sure. I do believe Tua is going to be a long-term guy there in Miami, so I'm not sure if I would take Jared Goff over, over Tua at that point. But I do believe he respectfully bl- – belongs in the Brock Purdy, Dak Prescott, Tua, Trevor Lawrence tier. Yeah, absolutely. I love love Jared Goff. Linked to a great offense with, like you said, Ben Johnson, who's getting the job done there. Got a top five receiver, at least in my mind, in Mona St. Brown. All the weapons in the world he needs. Probably a top five tight end at this point as well, and in a great backfield. So he's got all the help he needs. You finally piece things together with – this team, and I'm excited for him going forward, especially after earning that contract. I think it's it's a big move in dynasty that you can make and say this guy can probably be top 15 at worst at the position. Yeah. But you say Jared Goff, and I bring you Kirk Cousins, right? Kirk O'Chains. Kirk O'Chains, baby. Right now, he's valued at QB 26, and a lot has to do with his Achilles, which I'll get to in a second. But as of right now, he signed a four-year deal with a out in the third, so at least three years with the Falcons, with a plethora of weapons. They've spent high, high end draft capital on in Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and B. John Robinson. These are all guys he has at his disposal, and he's sure as hell going to utilize them. I'm excited for him in this offense. See what he could do. The Arthur Smith era is over in Atlanta. I think that's a breath of fresh air for all Falcons fans and the franchise in general. I'm excited to see what Kirk Cousins can do this year. I mean, he's been a model of consistency at the position since he was with the former Redskins after RG3 finally left the team. And he's been top 12 ever since in games he's played the full season in. I mean, you can't ask for anything better than that at QB 26 as far as value goes. He just came off – well, two seasons ago, he had a huge season with Minnesota. And I get he doesn't have a Justin Jefferson anymore. But he's got plenty of weapons still at his disposal. He's got so much of a – a little bit of like a shadow of what he had a few years back with Dalvin and uh, Justin Jefferson. And they filled in the hole with Kyle Pitts. But nonetheless, back to the Achilles. I get it's a concern. We're seeing the same thing with Aaron Rodgers this year, but – Cousins tore it later in the season. But here's the thing. A lot of these guys, like if a Lamar Jackson or a Jalen Hurts tore his Achilles, that would probably jar me as far as value goes. If you want to sell them at a cheaper value because they, lo- they lose a little bit of their rushing upside, I get it. But Kirk Cousins has been and always will be a pocket quarterback. I'm not expecting Kirk Cousins to roll out and try to rush for even five yards, especially after this injury. But that's not what he's going to be asked to do in this offense. And I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for him, especially with B. John Robinson in the backfield behind him. So, like I said, he's same price as – I don't know if you guys want to touch him in that area, but I definitely don't. He's in the same range as Deshaun Watson in a 2024 early second. I'll take Kirk Cousins at that range if I need a quarterback for for a championship push all day. So, when we discuss Kirk Cousins – a, anybody who lets their wife dress him up in Cole's clothes and comes out on an airplane after a huge road victory in Buffalo and does that with his chain, I'm all in, bro. Dude's got the dog in him. Yeah, Wrong or right? Right. Absolutely. Right. So, Kirk Cousins has been a model of consistency ever since his Washington days. I know, unfortunately, the injury to RG3 really put him into a spotlight to shine. Yeah. But he shined. He did. And he shined well. He's always been that guy who you can rely on in fantasy football to be a top 10, 12 finish. And then once he got to Minnesota, it skyrocketed. Talk about multiple 90-plus PFF passing grades. Talk about multiple seasons over 70% completions percentage. Talk about multiple 30 touchdown seasons. And guess what? None of that had any rushing upside. Maybe a sneak here and there. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. But guess yeah. what? As your QB2, when you're looking for a a game, a game manager with the ability to sling it, that's what Kirk Cousins is. He doesn't turn okay. the ball over. It's just smooth, pretty football. That's all it has ever been. Yeah. 
Now, you talk about the differences. He doesn't have a Justin Jefferson, but he has a top six O line, a yeah. top six O line and pass win rate. Yep. That's huge for Kirk yep. Cousins, especially how late the Achilles tear was. We had talked about it. We had <clears throat> questioned the Penix pick. And I do truly believe that if Kirk is not 100%, there's no reason to rush him out. You have three years of Kirk Cousins. Right. And the biggest staple was keeping Kirk Cousins upright. And this offensive line, like I said, is top six in pass blocking percentage win rate. That's huge for him. On top of the fact that you get your you get your number one, you get your number two, and you get your number three option. You have a running back that can take the load off of Kirk Cousins in the receiving game and the rushing game. Huge. Right. Yeah. Drake London, a true alpha receiver that we are high on who's up and coming in the dynasty ranks. And then, of course, Kirk Cousins' favorite weapon, the tight end. Right Always has been. Whether it had been Jordan Reed in Washington, obviously you have J.J., but then look at T.J. Hawkinson. Look at T.J. Hawkinson's targets. Look at his route percentages. Look at his participation. It's going to be huge for these weapons. Huge. Yeah. Yep. I'm excited for Kirk Cousins. Hey, you touched on it, but just to reiterate, 67%, we'll call it, 66.9% completion rate his whole career. Great. That's, We're it's talking all Drew Brees numbers. Like, that's yeah. Drew Brees. Yeah, it's, it's honestly insane when you break it down. But, all right, Steve, who you got next for your quarterback? You already mentioned. I, oh. I, think it's, I think it's a disservice to one of the greatest QBs to ever play the game. That'd be A.A. Ron, Aaron Rodgers. Seriously. Yeah. It's a disservice. QB 30. QB 30. In the trenches. In the depths of the trenches. We're talking about Daniel Jones. We're talking about Justin Fields. We're talking Justin, about Ross. We're talking about Justin a lot Fields of Justin Fields area. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the Justin Fields area, guys. So when you break it down, Aaron Rodgers, one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play this game, to ever grace our presence, one of the greatest fantasy quarterbacks to ever grace our presence. I don't have to pull up the resume. We know the resume. But what the Jets did for him this offseason, I love it. I'm in love with it. I know Tyron Smith isn't a model of consistency when it comes to being on the field, but he's an all-pro talent left tackle. Yeah. You don't add a guy like that for Aaron Rodgers if you don't have plans to win games. Trade back, and you still get, in my opinion – the number two tackle in this draft. You get Olu Fushanu at pick 11. Yep. Brees Hall is another year past the ACL. And we all know what Brees Hall was doing down the stretch of the season. Killing it. I haven't even mentioned Garrett Wilson yet. Haven't mentioned Garrett Wilson. We're talking about second <clears throat> for Brees Hall. Second in yards per carry from week 10 on. First in receiving routes ran, participation, and – targets. McCaffrey beat him by two receptions. We just want to throw that out there. But we're talking about a stud running back in the backfield. We talk about how important these guys are when it comes to taking the load off of a quarter of a quarterback. Huge. Garrett Wilson, the guy that we've been waiting to break out for two years now. This is it. Yeah. The time. This is, we thought it was last year, but time is now. Time is now. For Garrett Wilson. So with Gary Wilson, we all know about the demanding targets that he's he's earned. He 147 to 166 last year. We all know how bad it was when, you know, Zach Wilson, mix of Flacco. He actually looked really good with Flacco. He averaged over 20 fantasy points per game with Joe Flacco. Averaged under 12 with Zach Wilson. So any QB that can remotely get the ball into this receiver's area, he's going to make a play. He is one of the filthiest route runners in the league. He is smooth. He's fast. He's great after the catch. A receiver like that is only going to be money for Aaron Rodgers. Draft Malachi Corley, the Yak King in the 2023 NFL draft. Can make plays what they're comparing him to to be young baby Debo. I love a player like that for Aaron Rodgers. I really do. I'm not going to say he's obviously not Debo in that aspect. Got to see him play. Yeah. You bring in Mike Williams, another big play guy, red zone type threat, 6'4 receiver, big body, plays the ball. Plays tough. Love it. I don't know how healthy he is yet. We'll see as he comes in. And the names don't stand out as elite outside of Garrett and Brees, but there's guys that can do their job. Yeah. And there's guys that can make plays for Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers can make anybody look good. 
He's that he's that level of QB. Peyton did it for his whole career. Brady did it. Drew Brees did it. Rodgers did it. Here we are. QB 30. We're talking about almost backup level dynasty quarterback <clears throat> for one of the greatest to ever play the game. That's disrespectful. Yeah. So for those who are just joining in or may have not caught the intro, these are all guys that we're betting can lead us to a championship this year, right? We're not talking long-term dynasty. We're talking if you need a piece to make a push for the playoff, all these guys are are great for you. Aaron Rodgers is certainly one of them. He's been one of the best quarterbacks I think I've seen in a very long time. Maybe, honestly, for me, I'm a bigger person on Aaron Rodgers than most. I think he's one of the best maybe ever to do it as far as break it down, touchdown, interception ratio, just the sheer accuracy he has in the ball. Aaron Rodgers is a baller. I know he, we we missed the whole Achilles season. I would have loved to see what he did this year, but the time is now. And if you can go out and get Aaron Rodgers for the price that he's at right now, down in the dumps with Russell Wilson and Daniel Jones, who have almost no relevancy whatsoever, I think you're buying him at that price. No questions asked. Yeah. Yes. Man, QB 30. It, it's crazy. It's crazy that as we started playing the dynasty game back in what 2017 is when we first started our dynasty league. And when we really got invested in love dynasty football, you were talking about Aaron Rodgers. What top three QB? It's just who Aaron Rodgers is. Yeah. <clears throat> And for a for a thirtieth overall, it just seems so grimy. It yeah. really hurts. It really hurts to see these Hall of Fame guys fizzle out to the point of where they're at. Brady did it too, but guess what? Brady was always a buy, no matter what. For sure. But why would I never suggest Aaron Rodgers as a buy? Yep. Yeah. Um, we got some forward, though. Hey, we got some. I'm gonna bring one comment in first before we keep. Oh going. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> Would you trade Addison, Bijan, and Andrews a way to get one four, one five, and one eight? I already have one three Superflex Dynasty. I'm gonna say no. I I probably wouldn't do it. I mean, if you can move Andrews for maybe like the one oh eight, if you're looking to rebuild and it's not a tight end premium, I look at doing that. But there's no way I'm getting rid of Bijan for one oh four, one oh five area. Mm-mm. I think the sky's the limit for Bijan. I think you hold him, even if you are rebuilding. 103 <clears> is nice. I think you're going to get a great either quarterback or receiver there at that spot. Yeah. I say stay put with where you're at. Hold yeah. those assets and see what you can do with the season. Because one four, one five, one eight. I mean, I get neighbors there, Jaden Daniels. And then 108, you're looking at maybe even a Brock Bowers. But for Bijan, I don't know if I'm – I don't know if I'm willing to move it. No. For Bijan alone, I need the four and the five. Yeah. I think Bijan is just that essential of a piece to a cha- to a any roster, championship roster, rebuilding roster. We have yet to see the the ceiling for Bijan. Last year was really weird. And we talked about it with the non-injury disclosure. That was weird where Bijan didn't touch the ball game. Yeah. It wasn't even questionable into the game. How <clears throat> How Arthur Smith used Ty Algier a lot in situations where I thought Bijan should be having the ball. But then again, you see Bijan top five again. Like I said, receiving, receiving yards, percentage, receiving percentages, the snaps, the participation, juke rate, broken tackles, elusive rate. Those things stand out. You have yet to see Bijan touch the ball at an elite RB1 level. Yeah. Sure. You want to bring in one more? We got. I'm gonna bring in one here. more, and then we'll go on to yours. Bring yeah. one more, and we get back to the quarterbacks. Inquiring minds want to know: Is Antonio Gibson a short-term production asset? <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. I think if you're throwing away late picks, with how limited the skill position guys are in New England, I can see Antonio Gibson carving out some kind of role. Mm-hmm. Maybe not a huge role. To right. be honest, I think it's realistically fair to say that Hunter Henry is going to lead this team in targets, and that's scary. Because no, none of these rookie wide receivers, <laughs> nothing's carved out for them yet. Right. So I do think there's a chance short term that Antonio Gibson can have some kind of production, some production from Antonio Gibson. But believe, believe me when I say this, people forget that Ramondre Stevenson two years ago had 70 catches. 
Yeah, I was going to say, he's fighting with touches for Ramondre. I mean, Ramondre goes down. We don't ever want to project injury. Gibson steps into a pretty solid role with Drake May as a rookie quarterback. But I don't know. I think I'm a little bit more pessimistic about Antonio Gibson. I mean, he had a few good seasons to start out, but he's kind of fizzled out since then. He couldn't even outbeat Brian Robinson in Washington. Uh, he might make a push for a few touches, but like I said, more of a real life move, more so than a fantasy football move for the New England Patriots. It's one of those things. It's 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 the business of football. He's just got to stop putting the ball on the carpet, man. That's the big thing with him too. Is the fumbles are going to ruin his touches and then <laughs> they out his whole career. Yeah. That's why he got benched in the first place and within Washington. But nonetheless, um, my other quarterback since we're going to do two and two and then we'll move on to running backs is none other than Matthew Stafford coming off a pretty huge season, missed some games. Well, one at the end, but coming in at QB 27 feels a little low, much like Kirk cousins. He's a lot of success at the NFL level. He's had over 4,000 yards in plenty of seasons. Um, and then just in, I don't know, I feel like last year was kind of perceived as a down year for Matthew Stafford. He didn't hit 4,000 yards. His touchdowns weren't where they were the year before when he had 41. But you look at the bright side of things. He had 12.2 yards per completion in 2023, which is huge. That's the most he's had since 2013. And I'm not sure in my brain if it lines up, but I want to say it's around Calvin Johnson time. Um, so he's he's still got it. I mean, the weapons he has in Cooper Cup and Puga Nakua, Masua, are definitely helping his case in that when it comes to the 12.2 yards per catch for these guys. But, man, I mean, I love the situation he's in with Sean McVay. He's locked in for two or three more years. I think if you need a quarterback and you're in a pinch and you had a guy fizzle out, like a Sam Howell who you were hoping for, or even a Geno Smith who you bought in when he was having his good season, I think capitalizing on Matthew Stafford's value where it's at right now can kind of save you from those woes you had before. <clears throat> He's definitely, definitely valued at it, but you plug him in your Q- QB two spot. You don't have to worry about it for the whole season. I mean, you're, you're golden. And like I said, I gave you some comparables for value with, Kirk Cousins, I'll do the same thing with Matthew Stafford. He's in the same area as Jalen Warren and Calvin Ridley, who both of those I would kick to the curb to get Matthew Stafford if I was in need for a quarterback. And my team is absolutely stacked in need of maybe one or two pieces. I would dish out those guys or maybe even a second in 25 or 24 if you haven't already had your rookie draft. And just let him cook. Go out there with his guys and get the job done. Yeah. So people forget how many drastic changes the Rams went through in their in their time leading up to Stafford. You lose Todd Gurley to a unfortunate knee injury in 2020, and that's rough. A franchise running back who played like Todd Gurley to lose him that sucks. Right. After you won, you went to the Super Bowl in 2018. Huge contracts went to defensive players. A lot of trades went to defensive players. No draft capital. They didn't have a first-round pick since, what, I believe it was 2017, 2018. It's been a long time. This yeah, is the first year that the, that the Rams have had a first-round pick. Then Stafford wins the Super Bowl. You automatically lose your left tackle to retirement. And he was the only player who had a who had a PFF grade of a 90-plus on the offensive line over there. Yep. You hit on the diamond in the rough. Puka Nakua, great hit. Great hit. On top of the fact, people forget that Kyron Williams down the stretch was averaging over 22 touches per game. Passing volume had drastically fallen back. He played with a top six defense last year as well. All those things was a circumstorm like for that, for it to be a perfect, perfect scenario where McVay does what he does. Run first, right. leads on the running back, play great defense. Stafford wins me games if necessary. Yeah. You lose Aaron Donald. I think that has to go into the fact that the defense is going to get worse in some aspects. I do not believe that Kyron Williams is a 22 touch running back again, especially under 200 pounds. Those running backs typically don't last. We've seen a long injury history for Kyron Williams. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm trading Kyron Williams. I'm not saying I 
deflate his dynasty value in any aspect. Mm-hmm. But I think these things look into it. Like when you look at Stafford's 2022 year, Stafford threw the ball 36.6 times per game. That's a lot of passes. A lot. Yeah. Last year, 27. We're talking about nine less passes a game. Yeah. That matters. I mean, it's, it's certainly concerning. All the peripherals are there. You talk about over 12, 12 yards per pass, you know, things like that. It just stands out. Per completion. Per completion, excuse me. <laughs> so, Stafford's a great buy. I'll trade Calvin Ridley for him right now. Calvin, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Jaylen I mean, Williams I wouldn't good. hesitate. I'm down on really, especially with Titans. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. What? No excuse. That being said, I'm going to bring in one. Yeah. Before we transition to running backs, I'm going to bring in one comment and then we'll we'll hit the last comment. Outside of Kelsey, which KC wide receiver is the target? So I did see that Rasheed Rice's lawsuit had got dropped with that bouncer, that photographer. But we're still waiting here on the car crash and the incident from that. So I can't answer that. The the obvious answer, if no trouble is found, is Rasheed Rice. Yeah. I think but if you're until playing I know that until yeah. I know that, I'm gonna go with Hollywood. Yeah. Um, same on this side. If given the Rasheed Rice situation, if you want to play it safe, I think the buy right now is Hollywood. I don't have where he's at in the rankings right in front of me, but I know he's way far down there. Wide receiver, the, 30, wide receiver 39. Yeah, down, buried. Um, I think Worthy is a fine prospect, and I think he's going to work out in that offense, but at the price he's at right now, with him not, you know, rookie fever and all that, he's probably inflated so far up there. I think the buy right now, high. yeah, the well, buy right now is high. probably Hollywood. Yeah, the buy is Hollywood. Yeah. <clears throat> so, running backs. Would you like to cover your first running back, or would you like me to take my guy? You started quarterbacks. I'll start running backs. Fair enough. Why not start with Mr. Thumbnail? If you guys have already seen it, let's go ahead and knock this out. Coming into RB18, who for sure in this offense has a higher ceiling than that, is Mr. Derrick Henry. (sighs) Ever since he took over that job in Tennessee in 2018, he's not looked back. He's had a monster career. And every single year, people say, oh, this is the last one. This is." They said after the 2,000-yard season, that's it. He's done. They, after the 1,500-yard season, that's it. He's done. He's still kicking around. And he's buried, too. I mean, this guy, especially with the Ravens, has a chance to finish in the top 10 this year. Maybe even top five, depending on the touchdowns. Speaking of touchdowns, he's had more than 10 every year since 2018. And did it in just eight games in 2021 where he missed half the season. I think right now he's probably the biggest buy at the running back position. I mean, look at he's coming to this Raven situation, who you know for a fact they've been up there in rushing attempts 500 or more since 2018. Since since Lamar entered the building, they've rushed the ball over 500 times in this offense. All the opportunity in the world for Derrick Henry. You know for a fact they're going to look to him just like the Titans did to plug the ball in the, in the red zone when they get there. This is a high-powered offense that's going to be in the red zone a good amount, and Derrick Henry's going to eat that up inside 20. And on top of that, I didn't even like think about it when I was doing research, but looking at it, last year he had the 31st ranked offensive line. And then now he comes into the Baltimore, who's sitting in the top 10, ranked number nine last year. That's a huge upgrade in the offensive line for Derrick Henry. And even if he doesn't get those 13, 1400 yard mark, even if he gets 11, 1200 rushing yards, he can still see 10 plus touchdowns. I mean, you see it year in, year out. I think he can maybe even push to lead the league in touchdowns this year, given the situation he's in. I think they're going to look to him a lot. I think this is a match made in heaven, especially for Derrick Henry late in his career. I know he's 30, but I still think he's got some juice left in him. Yeah. So with Derrick Henry, I'll be honest, after we talked about that broken foot two years ago, I I thought that we would see a drastic fall off. And I think we did to a certain degree due to the fact of the 31st offensive line, 31st ranked offensive line, the terrible wide receiver play. They Listen, the Titans traded A.J. Brown for Traylon Burks, and I I can't answer that question. Can't answer it. But QB play was abysmal. Excuse me. 
Wide receiver play was abysmal. A lot of things went into the overall down year, quote unquote, from Derrick Henry. But guess what? The best part was he still finished running back eight. Yeah. <laughs> all that. Yeah, for all, that. Top 10. for all that. For all that. Derrick Henry is a freak athlete. Derrick Henry is unlike any other running back we've ever seen. He's built like a linebacker at the running back position. Yeah. So Derrick Henry in Baltimore is the biggest buy at the running back position. Yeah. Derrick Henry's league winner. These guys we're going to talk about tonight are are good. Derrick Henry's league winner. Yeah. That being said, back to what the Ravens did last year with their offensive line, while only having a, a fragment of J.K. Dobbins, Michael or Keaton Mitchell, and Justice Hill, all of them who are middle of the pack running backs, they still average four point nine yards per carry as a team. And you can tell me, oh, well, Lamar's a rushing quarterback. He's probably inflating that number. No, Lamar finished with 5.5 yards per carry. So he's not swaying it, and he didn't have the majority of carries. So I think on top of all this, I mean, Derrick Henry averaged 4.1 yards per carry last year with Tennessee with a 31st-ranked offensive line. Who knows what he can do behind guys like Ronnie Staley. I'm super excited to see what he can do. Dude's a beast, always will be, and I'll probably preach to for you to buy him until he retires. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also, people forget the fact that as a group with Lamar, JK, Gus, Dean, Justin, Gus, yeah, they had over twenty. What was it? Twenty six. Yeah, twenty six rushing touchdowns. Twenty six rushing touchdowns. Yeah, that's massive, massive. Derrick Henry, with no true, no true backup. Well, I mean, you got Justice Hill, you got Keaton Mitchell on the ACL tear. I think Sheena. Keaton, when he comes back from ACL, will be a fine backup, but he's not going to push for Henry's touches at all. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's no true backup early. You have a rookie running back in Rasheen Ali. You have Keaton Mitchell, who's coming on for ACL tear, and you have Justice Hill. Nobody's pushing for Derrick Henry's touches. It's not going to happen. Derrick Henry's going to touch the ball 270 plus times, and it's going to be it's going to be money. Yeah, I don't want to play him. We have to see him twice. I don't want to play him. Better watch out. There's going to be some tough games for y'all nowadays. Whew. Whew. How do you view Ken Dre Miller from a dynasty perspective? I value him a lot higher than what he's priced at. We're talking about running back 29 on the on the KTC, the keep trade cut. And obviously, I know it's not you know, it's universal for rankings here. It's not what we go off of. But Ken Dre Miller. Uh, interesting prospect was hurt coming out of TCU going into the draft got hurt last year as well if you look at Alvin Kamara's rushing metrics it was one of the worst seasons he's ever had from a rushing standpoint I do think you are seeing the end of Alvin Kamara only reason that you're not is due to the fact of the massive receiving upside Kamara is money because of the receiving upside I do think Kendra Miller is going to get up touches this year I really do and I think Kendra Miller is a great buy from the running back position. Kendra Miller was explosive at TCU, was efficient at yeah. TCU, and was a powerhouse. He is awesome. Yeah, I like Kendra. I like Kendra Miller. I was a big guy with TCU coming out, and I thought he was going to see some opportunity behind Kamara, but he pushed him out. Kamara had a, I mean, down on stats, but he's never really been a big rushing guy in his career ever. He's always been that receiving upside with rushing plus type of situation. Calvin Alvin Kamara has been known as a receiving guy. He's going to stay that his whole career. Yes, but there but were I times. Do think Kendry can carve out. I think his actual role. I think this year you see a little bit of it, but his actual role probably comes in twenty five. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's out of the question. Obviously, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I'm expecting them to be Ingram, Kamara to that level when Kamara came in the league. Right. But you could see a split in that aspect. Yeah. Right. I do not think you're going to see Alvin Kamara touch the ball as a running back rushes 200 times. I do not think you see it. No. You typically don't, to be honest with you, throughout his career. So my first running back I'm going to talk about Najee Harris. I see the man. <laughs> Najee Harris. Running back 26. You have guys like Zamir White, Jalen Warren, Blake Corum, Ramondre, Monty, and Mixon. Not saying that I wouldn't take Mixon, 
But I will say that at this point, it's close. It's close between those two. Running back 26, you could push him up to as high as running back 19 if you wanted. I think it's drastically, drastically underpriced for Najee Harris. I'm talking about a offensive line last year who I watched, and I'm going to say, quote, unquote, abysmal. Abysmal. 29th in overall run block win rate. It is bad. Matt Canada, offensive play calling, terrible. It was not pretty at all. So what do we do? We beef up the O-line. I don't have to go through our draft, but we first four draft picks were specifically offensive line. I love it. And we're going to get back to the trenches. We're going to play tough football. We're going to play gritty football. I love all our picks in our draft. I think we hit. I love them. On top of that, Arthur Smith. People talk about his tenure over there in Atlanta. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't good. But as an offensive coordinator, we've had – <clears throat> massive seasons in Tennessee. I know you're playing with a Ryan Tannehill, A.J. Brown, Derrick Henry tandem that was over there. But I do believe that Najee Harris offers a skill set that can be successful in a system like this. We're talking about three straight thousand-yard seasons. Obviously, I know it wasn't the most efficient, but we're talking about in those seasons, we're talking about three straight years of over seven-plus rushing touchdowns. We're talking about multiple years of over 40 catches. And we're talking about multiple years of three receiving touchdowns. Twice as a running back one, last year a running back two. You're talking about Najee being outside of the running back two range. We're talking about flex range for the running backs. How could you not like Najee? Yeah, I like I like Najee value right now, especially because you guys have vastly improved that offensive line through the draft. I, I think the upside's there. My only concern, if I had to say one, would be maybe looking at the Bijan and Algier situation kind of the same way you do as Najee and Jalen Warren, who the Steelers kind of believe in. But put everything aside, I think it opens up a lot for Najee to have that improved line. Like you said, the, the rushing side upside for him was very limited to that offensive line. I think they attacked it. They got Russell Wilson in there, who typically has always been in a pretty much run-heavy offense, especially with Marshawn Lynch. Lost a little bit with the Broncos, but you saw what happened. He turned into an average quarterback. But now he comes back with Arthur Smith and can run a system where it's run through the running backs with Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. And I think you're right. You're going to go back to hard-nosed Steelers football, and we can see Najee shoot back up into that top 12 season for yeah. – for a running back when he's being bought at what running back down at 26. Yeah. For off. Um, definitely somebody you want to take a, a chance on. I mean, this is a guy that you were getting like second round a few years ago and now he's plummeted for this, that, and another thing. I know that <sighs> people are down on him. I get it. I mean, even when he's said to hit a hole, sometimes he can't find it. But this offensive line is going to help him vastly this year. And put everything aside, coming from a Steelers fan, he saw it all, and I saw a good amount of it too. He didn't have no help. A lot of times he was pushed at the, at the line of scrimmage and got a loss of yards, which makes him look worse than what it is. Yeah. The biggest thing I can say is I don't buy into the offseason hype of I'm in the best shape of my life. But I will tell you, that Najee played at 240, I want to say 245 last year. Najee has never been 245. <laughs> never. Wasn't even at Bama last year. This year he's coming in at about 220, 225. And in the I'm excited to see it, man. I'm yeah. telling you, top 15 season is modest. I do believe Najee has a chance to be a back end running back one. Back end. Yeah. Like 10 12 range situation. Yeah, I can see I can see top 12 finish. Yes. Yeah. Who wins the running back two in new in the Jets, Izzy or Braylon? Braylon. I've been very impressed with what I've seen from Braylon. Braylon looks really good. I think Izzy, I think you can honestly cut Izzy. I think Izzy's gone. I mean, you didn't see him much last year. And it's hard, it's tough. I mean, you look at it as like a guy that how do you UCLA and then you get a Wisconsin guy who's like year in year out. They pump out running backs left and right. I mean, he's been touting the rock pretty strong since his freshman season. 
I expect him to kind of come in and take that role behind Brees. I think he got an unfortunate landing spot because I think on another team he could kind of push for a secondary role where in this case he's behind Brees Hall, who's a top two running back in my mind. And, it, I mean, it's a rough landing spot for Braylon, but he's for sure the two in this offense. Yes. Yeah. So, I don't know, ironically enough, we just covered Kendra Miller. But his counterpart, Alvin Kamara, for me, at least, at RB27, is still very much a buy in my mind. He's got the receiving upside, especially if you're in a PPR league. I think Kamara is a push. Last year, he saw 6.6 catches per game, which is the highest mark he's had since Drew Brees retired. Kirk, I mean, excuse me, Kirk Cousins. Derek Carr, late in his career, the last three seasons with Josh Jacobs and now Alvin Kamara, has gone to passing to the running back. You saw it, 63 targets to Josh Jacobs in each season, and Kamara with a high mark. I think he was at 83 last year. Yes. For targets, I think you're going to get a little bit more of that this year. I think he's going to serve as the out of the backfield, catch the ball, see what he can do with it. That being said, he's also due for a little bit of an uptick in touchdowns. The past two seasons have been a little rough. He's only had a handful. Last year, he had five rushing and one receiving. I can't imagine that getting much worse. It's it's tough to project touchdowns, but I would imagine more than six for Kamara is definitely on the table this season. He's got two years left in the contract. Really, I think he's probably got one and a half seasons left in him before Kendry ultimately takes the role. But look, man, he's never finished outside RB20. Even in his worst season where people were screaming, sell, 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 he was still running back 18. Which, I'm, I don't know about you, but in a market where the running backs are at right now, RB18 is still not the end of the world. I think right no. now, for what you're buying them at, outside of the Q, outside of RB2 range, it's technically a flex spot. If Kamara's in your flex spot, dude, that's going to be money for you this season. I really do think so. Derek Carr's gone to his running back often the last few seasons. I think that continues, especially in his offense with Dennis Allen. I get that. And that, I think... We touched on Kendry, and we do think that he can see a role. But we're seeing him push down, and I've even seen rumblings on Twitter already of people saying, hey, Kendry's taking the, taking the role this season. And we still don't know that. There's still so much time to go. I think he's, people are a little bit scared because of what happened with Eckler last year. He hit that wall and just plummeted. But I think Kamara, given he's only had fifteen hundred less than 1,500 rushes in his whole career, he's still got juice left in him. Right. Eckler got used and abused in Los Angeles. And I think Kamara still got some fresh feet in him for a, a season or two. So with Kamara, I do not believe you're going to see the efficient Alvin Kamara that we saw come out of out of Tennessee. I don't think you can expect that as a seven year vet as a running back position. A lot of wear and tear on Kamara's body. But I do think you're going to see the receiving prowess of Alvin Kamara. What yeah. you get in the receiving game is huge from him. And then what you get as a rusher is just icing on the cake. Right. Like you said, last year, six touchdowns. I remember watching Alvin Kamara score because six touchdowns on a Christmas game. Yeah. Alvin Kamara is a touchdown beast. Look at his look at his years in the league. First year in the league, he scored 14 touchdowns, followed it up with 18, followed it up with double digits the year after. I think some positive touchdown regression is coming for Alvin Kamara. Again, I know the teams were different. I know Derek Carr is not Drew Brees. I know I get all that. But Alvin Kamara has always had a nose for the end zone. Always has. Remember last year, he missed time. Also remember that. He did miss time. First three games out. Yeah. yeah. So – he has to be listed as a buy here. Running back 26, like he said, 27, excuse me, is flex territory at a running back position, not just running back, you know, just at the running backs, not mixed in with wide receivers, tight ends, all that. It is a flex spot. And I do believe that as Alvin Kamara last year averaged over 18 fantasy points per game down the stretch, he is a league winner. Yeah. I think especially because you're buying them in the same range as a Brian Robinson, who I don't value for much. And I get, 
I, I don't like using keep trade cut, but at the same time, it's what you guys are telling you, us that you value your players at as far as trades go. It's a community driven thing. So we use it to kind of gauge value to see where people's heads are at in the same range as the 25 second Ramondre Stevenson and Brian Robinson, who I think are two running backs in rough situations. Honestly, especially Ramondre Stevenson, who I've never really been huge on. I, I like Alvin Kamara in the range that he's at. Yep. Yeah. The last running back that I'm going to talk about tonight would be Joe Mixon. So I'll be honest with you. I think he's honestly honestly ranked properly at running back 20 on keep trade cut. But as you fall down this list, these running backs that have been league winners over the time, they just seem like values. Ninth to 10th round for Joe Mixon is just – just screams by to me. We're talking about on the same level as a as what it would be as a mid-2024 20, second, where me and you already discussed that we don't like the value in that area. We would rather move back into the third, yeah. trade for future picks. I'm giving that up for him all day long. Right. And it's not like he's, he's skipping a beat. I mean, not to cut you off, but he's going from the Bengals who have great offense to now the C.J. Stroud-led Texans, which is also a phenomenal offense. So, with Joe Mixon, the best availability is availability. There's only one season where Joe Mixon didn't play 14 or more games. And he doesn't miss time. He's always on the field. He has five running back one finishes in his seven years as a pro. He's a huge threat as a receiver. And the best part about it is, is this offense might be better than Cincinnati. <laughs> now, I mean, that's a tough call. Yeah. I mean, now, you got to at least say it's close, but it's, it's good, man. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> offense. I know we're talking about the hype of the receivers. I know you're talking about Nico, Tank Dell, Stephon Diggs, Dalton Schultz. I know there's a lot of mouths to feed. I get it. You may not see Joe Mixon with 70 catches, but he's a threat. He's going to be there. And to be honest, people were talking about Damian Pierce. I, I don't understand how the Damian Pierce is a thing anymore. After I watched Devin Singletary take over midseason and play his ass off, and that continued into the playoff run like it did in Buffalo the year before. And Devin Singletary to us is a mid running back, a average yeah. running back in the league. You get Joe Mixon, who has always been coveted as a first round pick. Got in some trouble at Oklahoma. We know we get it, but he's a highly coveted running back. And he has proven that he is a running back one. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. You don't have to bring up the incident. It's been. It's been a few years now. I'm just saying, man. It's, it has to go into it. He's just one of those guys. He's a highly coveted yeah. first-round talent running back. That's what Joe Mixon is. I know the yards per carry numbers aren't going to stand out to you as, as nice. He's a volume guy. He is a volume king. That is what he is. He touches the ball a lot. He gets going. He doesn't get going early in games. Mid-game, he's going to break you down. That's what Joe Mixon is. He's just going to break you down. A lot of touches, and he's willing to handle them. He loves it. Yeah. Man, it's – I don't know. We talked about it being on the show, and I, I, I'll i say it again for those that have joined late. It's – the dynasty world is so tough on vets. It, it They get buried so quick. Most of the time, running backs especially, they have one big season, and the following season people are ready to pawn them off. Like they didn't just almost win them elite or maybe even did win them a championship. Saw it with Jonathan Taylor. Saw it with Derrick Henry. I mean, it's year in, year out, there's guys that fall in value. And I'm sure it's just something we're going to talk about in the next show when we cover receivers. But Mike Evans, year in, every single year, somehow, some way, Mike Evans ends up being a buy at value. And yet he's still pumping out 1,000-yard seasons, being an absolute dog in fantasy. And people are pushing him off because he's getting up in age. I don't – age is only so far, right? Like – this podcast is in the context that you're ready to win a championship. And you need the extra piece. You're going to need a vet that you can get at a good value to help push you towards that. Right. You're not going to win with young guys, rookies that still have not proven themselves. It, it takes some vets to win championships. It's a fact I've seen it year in year out. I've done 
been in years and years of dynasty drafts, and you look at the teams that are winning it, and they have a few vets that have proven themselves, whether it be a Tyree Kill or a Keenan Allen or an Alvin Kamara who could have won guys, leagues last year at the end of the season. I mean, these guys are values every year, and yet they're pushed down every offseason because, oh, they're too old. They only have two or three seasons left. But it's still a window for you to win a championship. Look at this. We're talking about CMC at 27 years old, just signed a two-year $38 million extension. Yeah. So do with this information as you want. Veterans are a piece to dynasty championships. They are they are a main clog. They are important. And I'll be honest, people will undervalue them all the time. So you're always going to be able to have a window. We talked about Mike Evans. I mean <laughs> – I don't know how you talk about more consistent than Mike Evans. We're talking about 10 yeah. straight years of a thousand yard receiver, multiple double digit touchdown seasons, hall of famer, throw the gold jacket on his back. Anyway, not going to discuss receivers tonight. It's just, we're trying to just put this point out there. Really right. Hammer it home. Yeah. And veterans are important. Veterans are going to win you championships. Veterans They're lives hard. matter in dynasty, whether you like it or not. Veteran lives <laughs> Well, on that note, I am going to wrap this up with telling you that this weekend we are going to be live for the wide receivers and tight ends portion of this podcast. It is an important staple as well. Wide receivers, there's a lot of buys. Tight ends, there's a few buys that are really interesting and stand out. Other than that, if you guys, as always, if you guys like the content tonight, like Comment, subscribe, Dynasty Football Factory. After the show on Twitter, we are going to drop the YouTube channel so you guys can take a look at that. Check out what we're doing over there. Just produced three videos over there about our rookie coverage. This video will be live tomorrow. Also, again, all the information that's there for you guys at the DFF Network, Best Ball, Dynasty, Devi, Redraft, and DFS. It's, it's all there. It's so criminally undervalued. Guys, yeah. $4.99 a month, $1.99 annually is what it comes out to. How do you not want to subscribe and be a member and come in and be a part of our Discord and just conversate with some of the best fantasy minds in the game? It's huge. It's huge. So we just want to bring that up to you guys as well. Just know that that is an option. And we appreciate the DFF for allowing us to do this podcast weekly. We love it. So appreciate you guys over there. Ryan, anything you want to say before we get out of here? Yeah, no, per usual, thank you. Shout out to DFF for the opportunity to be on this stream tonight. Like we say every week, uh, same to the fans. For those that tune in tonight, we appreciate you so much. If you can call the back half, like Steven said, there's going to be a recap on Twitter, or excuse me, on YouTube tomorrow. So if you missed anything you'd be on any of the guys we talked about, that'll be available ASAP tomorrow. It'll be going up. That being said, I think that's all we got tonight. We'll see you guys Saturday. Yeah, we'll see you guys Saturday. And on that note, we are out.